Hello, I'm Hannah Donnett with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chandra is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to the second webinar in our new partnership series, Generation Chemical, how environmental exposures are affecting product reproductive health and development. The we webinar today is titled Environmental Reproductive Justice, Racial Disparities in Environmental Pollution and Chemical Exposures. This webinar series is brought to you in partnership with the University of California, San Francisco's program on reproductive health, the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, the Alliance of Nurses and Healthy Environments, the Endocrine Society, the International Federation of Fertility so Societies, and UCSF's Environment Research and Translation for Health Center. After the presentation, our moderator will lead a panel discussion. We will leave time following the panel discussion for a brief Q&A session. You may type in your questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. During the Q&A, Karen, our moderator, will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can. For, for those of you calling on the phone, we have posted today's slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slide. Everyone on our webinar right now is muted, with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 70 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Karen Wang. Karen is Chase Director and the founder of Because Health, an environmental health education campaign for millennials. As director, Karen has strengthened Chase programming to include sharing the latest science on how plastic pollution and climate change impact human health. She is also deeply committed and passionate about sharing science and education on the health effects of toxics and effective toxic reduction. She brings deep knowledge and experience in statistics, research methods, and data analysis. She particularly enjoys communicating scientific research to non-technical audiences. Karen completed her PhD in strategic management, a quantitative social science discipline grounded in applied economics and social psychology at the Foster School of Business at the University of Washington. Karen also holds a Master of Science in Earth Systems and a BA in Economics from Stanford University. Thank you for moderating today, Karen. I'll turn things over to you now. Thank you so much today. Um, welcome everyone to today's webinar, um, the second in our series, Generation Chemical, How Environmental Exposures Are Affecting Reproductive Health and Development. Um, I want to start by thanking Dr. Tracy Woodruff um, from the University of California, San Francisco, program on reproductive health um, and the environment for partnering with us on this series. Uh, we, could have not, we could have not done this without her support. Um, I also wanna thank all of our other partners once again, um, the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, the Endocrine Society, the International Federation of Fertility Societies and UCSF's Environmental Research and Translation for Health Center. So today we're going to be talking about environmental reproductive justice, racial disparities in environmental pollution and chemical exposures. When we were formulating the topics and thinking about speakers for this series, we decided that as part of our commitment to racial justice that we wanted to focus on environmental reproductive, reproductive justice at the beginning of the series, um, not as an afterthought, but more as a way to frame the presentations and discussions that are gonna come in the future when we talk about topics like infertility, fetal outcomes, maternal health, et cetera. Um, because justice um, and racism should be a part of every conversation in environmental reproductive health. It's because of that that we have asked all the speakers in this webinar series, not just today's presentations, to talk about the environmental reproductive justice aspects and implications of their research, in addition to interventions and policy implications. Um, so, you know, look out for that um, as we move ahead with the other webinars in these series. Today, we are so fortunate to have three amazing scientists and researchers who will give an overview of the topic and present some of their research on um, environmental reproductive justice. We will also save time for a panel discussion and audience Q&A. Um, I'm gonna introduce all three speakers and then we'll hear from, from them. Our first speaker is Dr. Tamara James Todd. 
She is a Mark and Catherine Winkler Assistant Professor of Environmental Reproductive and Perinatal Epidemiology in the Departments of Environmental Health and Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She is also an instructor in medicine at the Harvard Medical School and an epidemiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. James Todd's research focuses on environmental maternal health, where she evaluates how pregnancy and the postpartum period can be sensitive windows of exposure. She has a particular focus on racial and ethnic disparities in environmental exposures and women's reproductive health outcomes. Our second speaker today is Dr. Michael Bloom. Dr. Bloom is an associate professor in the Department of Global and Community Health at George Mason University. His research focuses on the intersection of environmental pollutants and human health in the United States and abroad, and is especially interested in the effects of endocrine disrupting compounds on human reproduction and fetal development, and on the disproportionate impacts of these agents among vulnerable populations. And our final speaker for today is Dr. Amy Padula. Dr. Padula is an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. Her research and expertise is on the effects of air pollution and social disparities on adverse pregnancy outcomes, including preterm birth, low birth weight, and birth defects. So with that, I will give it to you, um, Tamara. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation to present. I'm excited to be here today and to um, have an opportunity to, to give a different kind of presentation. So much of this presentation is going to, as Karen mentioned, um, really set the stage for uh, providing framework um, for how we can do this research in more depth um, at the intersection of environmental justice and reproductive justice with a specific lens looking at racial ethnic disparities um, in environmental reproductive health. So um, as an overview, I'm going to start this talk off with providing some definitions that will be guideposts for this presentation and then lay out that framework. I'll give an example from the work that we do within the James Todd lab as it relates to environmental chemical exposures and provide some relevance to the reproductive disparities and then provide an example um, that specifically comes from the epidemiologic work that uh, we do. And then some um, next steps, what are some you know, um, places that we should kind of consider going as environmental epidemiologists, environmental health scientists and reproductive um, health investigators. So to provide these key definitions, I first wanna lay the groundwork for saying race is really a social construct. And it's a social construct that is rooted in physical differences um, between groups of people um, as well as between cultures. And um, I provided um, the reference for each of where uh, these definitions, where they come from. This is from the American Sociological Association. Ethnicity, on the other hand, is shared culture, such as language, ancestry, and practices and beliefs. And since we're gonna be talking about health disparities, I thought it important to at least provide a lens to this. Um, and that this is a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. And so please note um, that that can really be beyond race ethnicity. It can be socioeconomic status, uh, place, um, as far as region of the world, um, urban versus rural, so on and so forth. So since we're talking about environmental justice, I think it's important to note, um, this is a definition um, from the US EPA, um, that environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income. And that has real implications for the development and implementation, as well as the enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. As a subset of this, environmental racism is really concerned about the conscious design or institutional neglect um, actions or decisions that really um, have impact on the disproportionate exposure, uh, particularly to people of color, um, as it relates to both environmental exposures um, and to the subsequent um, um, outcomes that are linked to that. Reproductive justice um, is defined as the human right to control our sexuality, our gender, our work, and our reproduction. And of course, it's inextricably linked 
to these issues of environmental justice and environmental racism. So I'd be remiss to not bring this up. Many of you are, you know, have definitely spent time in the public health space, understanding and learning about determinants of health, whether it's through the environment, as we're going to be talking about today, um, genetics, geography, um, behavior, and then social conditions and policies. And really, the issue at hand is that these are differentially distributed across the population. So the red arrows represent risk factors, and they can include things like environmental chemicals that um, we study in the James Todd lab, or air pollution, or any other um, social, political um, context uh, risk factor. And so the, the groups that are more vulnerable have many more of these red risk factors compared to groups that um, typically are more advantaged in the population, which have many more protective factors. And across the life course, and this is showing women's health, this is from a, 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 an article we published back in 2016, um, these can accumulate. And so this could contribute to a widening gap in an in, in increase in health disparities across the life course. So in environmental health disparities research, we spend time asking a lot of different questions and we do a fairly good job of asking questions about what. What are the environmental factors or chemicals that are, um, and, what, and what are their associations with a given health outcome? Um, whether or not um, there are disparities. Um, and we, so we describe associations. Also as environmental epidemiologists, um, we spend a fair amount of time um, asking who is at risk. And we, uh, as exposure scientists, um, try to figure out um, what are the, the, the predictors of the, the higher burden of both exposure and then um, on, the, on, on the epidemiology side, we also spend a fair amount of time trying to figure out who is um, at higher risk of the disease or outcome that we're interested in. We also spend a fair amount of time thinking about place or geographic region, um, where might there be higher uh, levels of certain chemicals or more air pollution, where might that be occurring? And we've been increasingly spending time asking when. Um, are there critical windows or sensitive windows um, in the course of an individual's life that may uh, add further susceptibility to a particular outcome? Um, so that um, perhaps the prenatal period, for example, is an important um, time period um, for organic chemical exposures, for example, as it relates to health outcomes. We also ask a fair amount of questions about mechanisms. So how, how do these um, um, various environmental hazards um, impact um, disease risk? Well, you know, is it working through epigenetic pathways? Are there hormonal pathways that these things are operating through? Um, are, there, there, are there various factors that, that contribute to that? But I feel like oftentimes there are key forgotten questions. And these questions are very relevant to environmental health disparities particularly. So specifically, we fail to ask often the why. Why do some populations have a higher exposure? And why is there a higher disease burden? And is there a connection between the two? And the so what? Can we do something about this? And I think asking why really matters. It's relevant as far as being able to really uh, get buy-in and trust from a community, particularly communities and populations that are understudied, that are high exposure and high risk. It is also really key to developing sustainable and well thought interventions. And furthermore, asking why really has a, a tremendous impact on policy and social change um, that will improve health. And I think that once we ask these questions, it can reveal a lot. For example, it can reveal that structural racism may be an under, underpinning of some of these differences in the exposure and disease um, out, um, uh, outcomes and situations that we're seeing. It could reveal that there are stress and environment interactions or that there are access or availability issues. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. It could also reveal that there's housing and energy injustice that could be placing people at risk as well as uh, beauty and justice, as some of um, our colleagues have shared with us um, in the past. So there, there are many things that could be contributing to these disparities that we see. The key is that they're modifiable. So I can't change someone's race, 
but I can think about what are the driving factors that are behind this. And so this is where we lay out the framework. So oftentimes as environmental epidemiologists, we spend a fair amount of time really thinking about the downstream factors. We spend time um, thinking about the environmental exposures and understanding the association with the outcomes of interest. And as, in, in, as exposure scientists, we spend a fair amount of time trying to really understand what the predictors um, um, are from both a social or cultural um, or even behavioral um, side of things as it relates to understanding differences we see or predict, predicting um, environmental um, exposures. Down here, these are just examples of different um, um, uh, subsets or uh, different ideas. For example, for behavioral factors, it might be that diet or uh, product use or smoking are contributing to some of the, the environmental exposures. But the fact is that we rarely think about this in the context of all of these factors and how these things may be really um, being driven by political context, as well as by, by behaviors that are associated with some of these social and political uh, factors. So examples that come from some of my work um, looking at uh, disparities in environmental chemical exposures um, are we've spent a lot of time looking at non-persistent endocrine disrupting chemicals um, that are commonly found in personal care products. They're also found in other um, um, consumer products such as food packaging and medical uh, devices and medications. So these chemicals are known as phthalates and you'll hear more about them today from Dr. Bloom. Um, but I just wanna provide this example that from data that was published uh, back in 2014 from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, we see that there are indeed differences by um, gender with women having much higher concentrations, particularly of these um, metabolites of, of, of these phthalates that are more commonly found in personal care products. It's also worth noting that we reported that um, African Americans and Mexican Americans had significantly higher concentrations here represented by the red and green bars of these same chemicals. So um, this intersection of women and particularly women of color having much higher concentrations of, of these chemicals um, that are commonly found in personal care products. Just to drive this message home a little bit more, parabens also uh, a non-persistent um, chemi um, endocrine disrupting chemical uh, found commonly in personal care products as well as uh, diet. This is also from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Um, and uh, this was published by Dr. Antonia Calfat, also showing that there are racial ethnic differences. And this is really across the life course showing that non-Hispanic black women have significantly higher concentrations of, of both of these types of parabens, uh, methyl and propyl paraben here. And so the, the, the importance of this as it relates to women's health is that we know that there are links uh, between phthalates and phenols, parabens being um, a, a phenolic compound um, for infertility and subfertility, preterm birth and pregnancy hyperglycemia, endometriosis and fibroids, adipogenesis and obesity, diabetes and glucose intolerance, as well as thyroid disease and early puberty. So when we're talking about, you know, this idea of you know, oftentimes I get pushed back that race has to be biological since we're seeing differences. What people fail to realize is that what could be really driving this is that there are higher exposures in populations that um, may, that really may impact the underlying biology of the individual. So when we're thinking about pregnancy health, once um, um, it's really important to note that Higher phthalate exposure, for example, is associated with a 20% decrease in antrofollicle count and a threefold increased risk of pregnancy loss. And this comes from data from the Earth study um, um, that Dr. Russ Hauser um, um, is the PI of. And it's also associated with higher phthalate exposure um, um, so that there's a twofold increased odds of preterm birth and lower birth weight. And this has been shown across a number of studies. It's also linked to an increased risk of preeclampsia, as well as higher glucose levels, excessive gestational weight gain, and a 60% increased risk of gestational diabetes. So again, thinking about, you saw those differences in exposure, could there be a connection there uh, for some of these conditions? And why might you ask that? So it's important to note that Hispanic 
and Black girls are more likely to reach menarche earlier, which has implications for breast cancer risk and a variety of other cardiovascular um, outcomes. It's also important to note that Black women are two times as likely to experience infertility. Um, it's important to note that Native American women are seven times more likely to um, have a pregnancy complicated by gestational diabetes, and that Asian and Hispanic women are two to three times more likely to um, ex ex also experience a pregnancy with gestational diabetes. It's important to note that Black women are 50 percent um, have a 50 percent increased risk of preterm birth, and that there are uh, that Black women are two to three times more likely to experience um, uh, fibroids. And finally, um, that approximately 50% of Black and Hispanic women enter pregnancy already obese. So when we're thinking about the linkages here, it's important to note that many of these um, outcomes are in fact disparate across race by race. So just to summarize this and wrap this up with an example um, from research that we're, um, that's been ongoing in our lab, um, I'm going to walk you through um, an example on hair product use, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and racial ethnic differences in preterm birth. Um, this, day, this started with a work that we did with the Greater New York Hair Product Study that I founded um, now some time ago, where we recruited 359 women. And what we were really interested in and used mixed methods to do was to understand racial ethnic differences in the patterns of hair product use. So we did qualitative and quantitative data analysis to design a questionnaire to understand hair product use. And then we also had these products tested for, at the time we were interested in estrogen content. These were the different types of hair products that we um, happened to um, see uh, with respect to uh, what women uh, told us. And these were the differences that we saw by race ethnicity in hair product use. And so we saw that uh, black women, African-American or African-Caribbean um, by far used more um, of these different types of hair products. We also saw that based on the ingredient label um, content that, that African-American 50, almost 50% 50 of African-American women used um, a, a hair product that was labeled to contain parabens, uh, placenta or other endocrine um, disrupting chemicals um, compared to only about 7% of non-Hispanic white women. We shared our list of commonly used hair products with Silent Spring Institute and Dr. Jessica Helm and um, in, in Silent Spring uh, tested the products that we um, um, provided to them as, in list form and identified that every single one of them that um, um, was in this case marketed to black women contained in a form of endocrine disrupting chemical. So note that products, consumer products in general are typically mixtures. And so hair products are, are chemical mixtures and we wanted to understand did they have hormonal activity? So uh, currently under review, we have shown that in, indeed um, products that are still currently on the market um, do have estrogen and progesterone, are able to bind to the estrogen and progesterone uh, receptors and have agonistic and antagonistic properties. And so now we kind of start putting this together and we have shown that um, we collected data in the Environmental Reproductive Glucose Outcome Study, uh, also known as the ERGO study, it's a prospective cohort study, now of over, over 600 women um, in the Boston area. And what we found is when we ask about hair product use, specifically hair oil use and daily hair oil use is associated with a 10 day earlier delivery. And so we are now looking a bit further into understanding whether or not this is indeed attributed to phthalate and other uh, non-persistent chemical exposures commonly found in uh, personal care products, including hair products. This is just an overview of other work that's being done. Um, that the first uh, set of studies um, highlight research being done by Dr. Kim Harley. Um, Dr. Amizoda has been doing work in, on feminine hygiene products, phthalates and fibroids. The PROTECT study is doing some ongoing work within the Puerto Rican population. And then in our own lab, we're doing work around acculturation, phthalates and gestational diabetes in Asian women, as well as really understanding um, the links between environmental chemical exposures and uh, black maternal health as it relates to both pregnancy and postpartum health. I will end here with just stating that we have work to do. We need to study more diverse populations and we need to understand individual and contextual determinants of endocrine disrupting chemical exposures or just other environmental exposures 
including measuring social, cultural, and policy-based determinants in our studies. This really involves a multiple disciplinary approach. It is not sufficient to simply do effect modification and test for and, and conduct our studies doing stratified analyses. We need to do a better job of thinking about this medi multiple mediation model that I presented, as well as thinking about mixed methods, um, multi-level modeling, and other analytic techniques. We need to consider social and environmental interactions. And we also need to understand and look at more um, understudied um, uh, chemicals and think about understudied reproductive outcomes. Because at the end of the day, we want to go from a model that looks like this to a model that looks like this. And so to do that, we need to develop interventions that are both community relevant and population facing. I think my, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, research group and I will take questions. Uh, you feel free to use the question, the Q&A and chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. James Todd. Um, what a great presentation so far to launch us into this webinar. Uh, well, our next speaker is pulling up his slides. Um, I just want to remind our audience that you can put in your questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom, and uh, we will get to them at the end after the panel discussion. Great, Dr. Bloom, you want to take it away? Pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Hannah, Dr. Wang, and the CHE organization and partners for this opportunity to speak with you today and in such esteemed company. I will describe select results from a birth cohort study investigating associations between fetal development and environmental pollutants among black and white women. I have nothing to disclose. Endocrine disrupting chemicals are exogenous agents that interfere with hormone activity leading to adverse health effects. And as one group of endocrine disruptors with disparate exposures, as uh, Dr. James Todd um, discussed, the toxicologic and observational evidence for phthalate diesters as human reproductive toxicants is compelling. Phthalates are comprised of various synthetic chemicals that are widely used to impart flexibility to plastics, as coatings for medications, as solvents in cosmetics and creams, and as carriers and fragrances. Pregnant women are exposed via inhalation, ingesting food products contaminated by packaging or during prep, dermal absorption of cosmetics and personal care products or house dust. More than 99% of pregnant US women had detectable urinary concentrations of at least one phthalate in the early 2000s and more recent literature corroborates ongoing exposure. Experimental literature demonstrates that specific phthalates are antiandrogenic, estrogenic, and impact thyroid hormones. For example, this histologic section of a control testis from a male rat on the top left-hand side of the screen shows regular organized seminiferous tubules and small focused nests of androgen synthesizing Leydig cells. Compare this to the histologic section from a male rat exposed to dibutyl phthalate, or DBP, during gestation a phthalate widely used in personal care products. There are dysplastic, disorganized seminiferous tubules and hyperplastic overgrown nests of Leydig cells. Likewise, on the upper right-hand side of the screen is a histologic section from a thyroid of an unexposed control rat. You will see orderly and uniformly distributed follicles. In contrast, the histologic section from a diethyl hexothalate or DEHP treated rat a phthalate used in polyvinyl chloride plastics is hyperplastic and disorganized. These and other endocrine disrupting effects have potentially critical implications for fetal growth and pregnancy maintenance. Epidemiologic studies in the US and abroad have reported associations between gestational phthalate exposures and fetal development, albeit with some inconsistent results, but including gestational age at delivery, birth weight and size, and genital development, among others. Additional reports describe differences in circulating androgen, estrogen, and thyroid hormone concentrations among pregnant black and white women, suggesting potential differential vulnerability to endocrine disrupting chemicals, including phthalates. These differences might contribute to the greater frequency of adverse pregnancy outcomes experienced by black women in the US. Yet, no studies had explicitly assessed potential differential fetal developmental impacts for gestational phthalate exposure among black and white mothers in the US. Our study was initiated to help address this important research gap. The study began as a collaboration between the Medical University of South Carolina 
and the Hollings Marine Laboratory of the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Charleston, South Carolina, shown here. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Roger Newman and other colleagues listed here who carried out this work. From 2011 to 2014, we enrolled 391 pregnant women during a routine fetal anatomic ultrasound at a median of 20 weeks gestation, time one or T1. Women completed a study questionnaire and donated urine and blood specimens for analysis. Women more than 18 years of age with first trimester ultrasound data gestational age, plans to deliver at the Medical University of South Carolina, and then uncomplicated singleton pregnancy were eligible. A subsample of these women returned for routine follow-up prenatal exam between four and 14 weeks later and provided a second urine specimen at 24 to 32 gestational weeks, time two or T2. At delivery, we collected urine, blood, and cord blood from 319 women. 152 women self-identified as black race and 158 identified as white race and are included in this analysis. We completed a series of anthropometric measures on newborns and we abstracted birth outcomes from the electronic medical record. Women's urine specimens were analyzed for eight monoester metabolites of highly prevalent endocrine disrupting phthalates using liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry. Here, you'll find the concentrations of the various phthalate metabolites listed along the bottom of the figure including MBP, MIBP, MBZP, and EHP, MEOHP, MEHHP, MEP, and MMP, or the molar sums of related DEHP metabolites and DBP metabolites. The boxes with whiskers represent the distribution of phthalate metabolite concentrations in black mothers as green and in white mothers as yellow, with the central line indicating the median or the 50th percentile of the distribution and the X indicating the arithmetic mean or the average of the distribution. More extreme observations are shown as individual circles. You will see that most green boxes are positioned higher on the figure than the yellow boxes. The logarithmic concentration scale on the left-hand side indicates that the small spacing differences translate to large urinary phthalate metabolite concentration differences. In fact, Nearly all phthalate metabolite concentrations were significantly greater among black mothers than among white mothers. The only exceptions, MEOHP and MEHHP, are secondary oxidative metabolites of MEHP, and so the exposure picture is a bit more complex than for the others. The median phthalate concentrations were greater overall than for U.S. women 18 to 44 years of age, as represented by the red lines here. Among the 310 singleton newborns, the risks of preterm birth, delivery at less than 37 weeks completed gestation, and low birth weight weighing fewer than 2,500 grams were similar to the 9.5% and 8% reported for the U.S. population in 2014, respectively. However, Black women delivered earlier than white women on average in our study. We also found lower birth weight and a higher risk for intrauterine growth restriction measured as small for gestational age according to a reference distribution for black women compared to white women. These forest plot type figures show regression coefficients or average differences in standardized birth weight and 95% confidence intervals for associations with a one log unit greater urinary phthalate concentration in nanogram per milliliter among 310 mother infant pairs. The models were adjusted for maternal age, body mass index, cigarette smoking, and education. The associations for MBP, MIBP, MBZP, MEHP, and MEOHP are on the left-hand side of the slide. The associations for MEHHP, MEP, MMP, and the molar sums of DEHP and DBP metabolites are on the right-hand side of the slide. The rows represent the associations for each measured urinary phthalate metabolite at T1 and T2, corresponding roughly to the second and third trimesters, respectively. The magnitude of the difference in birth weight standard deviations is specified by the x-axis below. The null value of no association is represented by the solid vertical line at 0.0, .0 on the x-axis. 
you will note that there is an overall tendency toward lower birth weights with greater urinary phthalate concentrations at T2, indicated by the filled dot symbols falling to the left of the vertical no association line. For MIBP and MMP, the 95% confidence intervals exclude the vertical line of no association, suggesting that the results were incompatible with the null hypothesis, essentially greater third trimester concentrations of urinary MIBP and MMP were associated with lower birth weights. The magnitudes of the differences in the birth weight standard deviations associated with greater urinary phthalates are provided in the insets. In a similar pair of forest plot type figures, stratified by black race in green or white race in yellow, you will again see a general pattern of lower birth weights associated with greater T2 urinary phthalate concentrations, although the associations differed by race for MEP only. Here, there was little effect for black women, but greater exposure was associated with lower birth weight for whites. This result was unexpected. Given substantially higher urinary MEP concentrations measured among black women relative to their white counterparts. The magnitude of the differences in the birth weight standard deviations associated with greater T1 and T2 MEP are provided for black women as B and white women as W in the inset. These figures show the association of T1 or second trimester maternal urinary phthalate metabolite concentrations operationalized as tertiles. So think low, medium, and high concentration groups with the risk of preterm birth among all 310 mother-infant pairs. You will see that greater urinary MEHP, the primary metabolite of the polyvinyl chloride plastic additive DEHP, was associated with higher preterm birth risk with the 95% confidence intervals excluding the vertical no association bar. However, it is also important to note the imprecise nature of these effect estimates, given 28 preterm births in the analysis and indicated by the log scale on the x-axis here. In further statistical analysis, we detected several differences in the phthalate preterm birth associations according to maternal race including for MIBP, MEHP, and MEP as shown in these figures. For each log unit greater urinary MIBP and MEP concentration, agents found in personal care products, black women experienced higher risk for a preterm birth, whereas white women did not, as specified by the odds ratios in the insets. In contrast, the aforementioned association between greater urinary MEHP found in PVC plastics with preterm birth appeared to be limited to white women without an increased risk of preterm birth for black women. Again, these effect estimates were quite imprecise as they were based on a small number of preterm births in each subgroup. Shifting gears a bit, here we examined head circumference, which reflects neurodevelopment. Reduced head circumference at delivery is predictive of neurocognitive delays. The dot symbols here reflect percent difference in newborn head circumference for a doubling in urinary phthalate concentrations at T1 and T2, again corresponding roughly to the second and third trimesters. You will see a tendency for the T2 measures to be associated with smaller head circumference among all 310 mother-infant pairs. However, only for MEP does the 95% confidence interval exclude the vertical line of no association, a metabolite of DEP used widely in lotions and personal care products. A doubling in maternal urinary MEP was associated with an approximate half percent smaller head circumference at delivery, about 1.7 millimeters. Head circumference was not associated with mode of delivery. We again investigated heterogeneity by maternal race. However, we were somewhat surprised to see stronger associations between gestational phthalate exposure and smaller newborn head circumference among white women than among black women. We detected statistical interactions indicative of heterogeneous effects for MBP, MBZP, MEHP, MMP, and the sum of DBP metabolites. For the most part, Greater third trimester maternal urinary phthalates were associated with smaller head circumference among newborns delivered to white, but not to black mothers, 
and there was a weaker association for second trimester urinary phthalates. Today, I've described select results from our prospective investigation of phthalate exposures among black and white mothers from Charleston, South Carolina. There were differences in exposure according to maternal race. Black mothers had consistently greater urinary phthalate metabolite concentrations than white mothers, indicative of higher average levels of exposure to phthalates. There were also differences in the associations between urinary phthalate metabolites and fetal developmental outcomes between black and white mothers. There were additional differences that I didn't present today, and there were further differences for female and male infants. Yet, we did not find a clear pattern of differences in terms of greater or lesser magnitudes in black or white mothers uniformly, nor did the magnitudes of effect estimates track consistently with differences in urinary phthalate metabolite concentrations in black and white mothers. There were clearly disparities in exposure, but the impact on fetal development was less clear. Self-identified maternal race may have misclassified some women, and without paternity information, we were unable to identify newborns with mixed race parentage, leading to further misclassification. We also did not integrate data on maternal psychosocial stressors, including perceived racism, which a growing and compelling literature suggests potentiates the toxic effects of environmental pollutants among black women. Still, our results raise a red flag and given the particularly small size of our study, especially when looking at race, they merit the design of a larger study to more definitively characterize the contribution of phthalates to ongoing reproductive health disparities. Also, further work is necessary to identify sources of reproductive toxicant exposures among pregnant black women for developing targeted interventions to help to eliminate the disparity. Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Bloom, for your presentation. Uh, we're getting ready for our last presentation of the day. Um, Dr. Padula will be pulling up her uh, slides momentarily, but while she's doing that, um, please keep sending those questions in. We're getting some great ones, and we'll get to your questions after the panel discussion. I think I'm unmuted now. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Che, for inviting me to this webinar. It's really an honor to be among this group. Um, so I'm sorry. Let's see. I'm Amy Padula from the Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment from the University of California, San Francisco. And today I'll be talking um, about the Cal Enviro screen, which is an environmental justice tool. Um, and thank you, Dr. James Todd, for um, introducing and defining environmental justice for this group. Um, so I'll be talking about the cumulative environmental exposures and the social factors that um, make up the Cal Enviro screen uh, in California, and then how we have used it to examine how these factors are related to preterm birth um, in Fresno County and across the uh, state of California, but today I'll focus mostly on uh, Fresno. Uh, and then I'll end uh, with some ideas or next steps um, that we will hope that will hopefully set the stage for a discussion of how we can further this work and combat environmental racism, racism and health inequities. So the Cal Enviro screen is short for the California Communities Environmental Health Screening Tool. And this is a screening and mapping tool used to identify communities that are disproportionately burdened by pollution. And the Cal EPA asked OIHA um, to develop the Cal Enviro screen to identify communities suffering from cumulative impacts of multiple pollutants and people who are vulnerable to the, um, and basically populations that are vulnerable to pollution's effects. And it was initially released in 2013 and is currently on its third version. And disadvantaged communities in California are especially targeted for investment of proceeds from California's cap and trade program. And these investments 
are aimed at improving public health, quality of life, and economic opportunity in California's most burdened communities, at the same time reducing pollution that causes climate change. And here's a link um, at the bottom where you can uh, go to their website and um, find where you live or communities of interest and see how it compares to the rest of California um, with regard to different pollutants. So the Cal Enviro screen is composed of two parts, the pollution burden and the population characteristics. And here's a list of images with all the different indicators that are included. And they are further broken up into two additional groups. Um, so starting here on the left, are the environmental exposures, uh, including air pollution, uh, drinking water pollution, uh, pesticide use. And these exposures are me measured fairly precisely and, and assigned to each census tract. Um, and then the environmental effects include more ecological sources, um, such as groundwater threats, uh, solid waste sites, um, hazardous waste, um, and so forth. And the population burden score, which I'll be talking about in a little bit, is the combined, is the combination of all these environmental factors. Um, the exposures are weighted a little bit higher because they're more precisely measured than the environmental effects, but um, all of them are included. And then on the right um, are the population characteristics. Um, and um, and this includes vulnerabilities, both in terms of disease burden in the population, like asthma, cardiovascular disease, and low birth weight, um, and also with socioeconomic factors like education, income, poverty, unemployment, and linguistic isolation. Um, and, um, and then each indicator is scored and then also ranked uh, to create a percentile and then the indicate, indicators are scored in these subgroups as well and then put all together for the Cal Enviro screen score. Um, and that's how these disadvantaged communities are identified. So here's a map of the total environmental, uh, the total Cal Enviro screen score across California um, with the red areas having the highest score or the most most disadvantaged areas. And these data are summarized at the census tract. And when I first saw this, I thought, could this be used for epidemiologic research? Um, so uh, you know, to learn more about how these environmental factors, both individually and cumulatively, could affect health outcomes can beyond the asthma and cardiovascular disease and low birth weight that they already include. And I also wondered whether clinicians would be interested to know where their pa patients came from and if that might help them understand potential causes or triggers or risk factors for disease. Um, and, um, and for this project, I was interested in whether this, um, the Cal Enviro screen could help us learn more about potential environmental influences on preterm birth that we, um, that we haven't had a chance to to study individually. Um, and then finally, um, could it help us more clearly demonstrate the double jeopardy of being exposed to pollution and a more disadvantaged neighborhood with regard to uh, risk of preterm birth? Um, and on the website, you can zoom in you know, to your area in California or an area of interest. Um, and, um, and find out kind of your score in all these different areas and, and your total score. Um, so I invite people to, to check it out. Um, and when you zoom in on the Fresno area, um, you can see um, that it certainly ranges, although most of the, most of the population do, don't live here in the mountains, but rather um, in these smaller boxes. Um, and this diagonal line kind of going through um, is the, the 99, um, which is a big road with lots of diesel trucks um, and, and traffic. So that's why um, so much uh, pollution is, is centered around there um, along with other sources. Um, and, this is, and Fresno is also an area um, with uh, high rates of preterm birth, which I'll talk about on the next slide. 
So, um, so preterm birth, as you, as many of you know, is a strong predictor of infant mortality and morbidity, and has also been associated with adverse health outcomes and development throughout childhood and adulthood. Um, and yesterday was World Prematurity Day, which is started to bring awareness that one in 10 babies are born too soon worldwide. Um, and in, um, <clears throat> and for, this, um, for this study that we did, we used uh, all the singleton live births from 2009 through 2012 in Fresno County, which included over 50,000 births. Um, and during this time, a little over 9% were preterm. Uh, and we were also interested in early preterm birth, which we defined here as less than 34 weeks to see if the associations between uh, pollutants and from birth may be stronger in this or may be different in this um, group uh, because previous studies that we'd done on air pollution had shown stronger associations for this earlier, more um, severe uh, category of preterm birth. So I'm starting here with um, some of our um, results on from pollution burden. So this again is the com combined uh, environmental factors and exposures. And uh, these are odds ratios and 95% confidence intervals um, comparing each quintile to the lowest quintile of pollution burden. And these estimates are adjusted for age, education, race, ethnicity, and payment of delivery costs, um, which um, is basically like insurance type, like public or private. Um, and Medi-Cal, the kind of public insurance in California covers more than half of the births in California. So this is really an indicator of socioeconomic status. Um, and this shows that the, um, that those who are exposed to higher levels of pollution burden are almost twice as likely to um, give birth to a preterm uh, baby. And here are some additional um, uh, results that I've just pulled out um, that were statistically significant, although we did look at all of them. So if you're interested, you're um, welcome to check out um, the paper to, to see how they vary across all of the different um, uh, indicators. Um, but drinking water also stood out um, in showing associations with preterm birth. Um, so the total drinking water score, which again was accumulation of um, several uh, uh, drinking water contaminants, um, and then uh, uranium, is also associated um, and it has been shown to have higher levels uh, in this Fresno area. Um, it had been in the news actually a, a few years ago. Um, so that is a, had been a, a contaminant of concern. Um, and then trichloroethylene uh, also has a small, um, fairly significant uh, association with preterm birth. Um, so we were really, really interested in the interaction of pollution burden and vulnerable populations, which the Cal Enviro screen is really uh, focused on. Um, and there's increasing evidence that there's this double jeopardy of being exposed to pollution and a disadvantaged neighborhood with regard to risk of preterm birth and, and other adverse health outcomes. Um, but as Dr. James Todd mentioned, there's much more work to be done um, on what um, and how we change this now that we've identified it. Um, and, uh, and here are the results when we split the, um, when we stratified by socioeconomic factors um, based on or defined as below the median in, um, in education, above the median for linguistic isolation, unemployment and poverty. Um, and these are these factors are all part of the Cal Enviro screen, but they originally come from the American Community Survey. Um, so when we separated them into high and low socioeconomic status and then looked at the associations between the environmental exposures and preterm birth, um, we did find higher associations um, uh, for exposure scores, which is, again, it's that component of pollution burden that are the more um, 
more precisely measured exposures, and then also the drinking water uh, score. Um, I keep losing my button here to move forward. Um, and then next we looked at the early preterm birth also stratified by socioeconomic status. And, and as we had suspected, we did find lower um, or um, stronger associations in the lower socioeconomic status category um, for the early preterm births. So, uh, and many and several more uh, factors or um, pollutants um, became significant. So diesel particulate matter, um, toxic release, which is um, toxic air pollution, uh, traffic, again, more air pollution, and then drinking water, and then the total pollution exposure scores. Um, and this, I think, also says a lot given that the early preterm birth is, is a more severe um, kind of category of preterm birth. Um, and also in this population was 2% of the population. So, um, you know, we were not as well kind of powered to, to detect this, um, but given that um, the associations were so strong, it was possible. Um, and then here are the results stratified um, by some pretty crude um, categories of, of race ethnicity, which, um, so I understand this is unsatisfying on several levels, but um, both because we um, stratified by on the median for the exposure, um, which is not of course very precise. Um, and then also lumped together um, all non-white, non-Hispanic births um, to have uh, more kind of even categories to uh, compare white non-Hispanics, non-white non-Hispanics, and um, the majority of the population, which were Hispanic. Um, so there's a lot more work to do here, but I just wanted to share what we had found as a starting point um, that, um, that there are, the differences um, aren't so strong probably due to the way we looked at it, um, but that there are um, some slight differences across uh, different racial ethnic groups. Um, particularly, I think the diesel particulate matter um, is notable um, here. And then I just, um, just as a little tidbit on the rest of California, we did have another investigation in this area. And as you can see, the, um, the, the associations were smaller in magnitude, but much more precisely um, estimated um, given the large size of California. Um, but again, there are more results here um, uh, in this uh, paper if you're interested. And then I also just wanted to include some of the work that we're uh, doing that's in progress, um, expanding to hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Um, so linking the birth records also to hospital discharge records um, from 2007 through 2012. Um, and we were focusing in again on the drinking water contaminants um, in relation to gestational hypertension, preeclampsia and eclampsia, and have found um, some associations with several of the drinking water contaminants. So, um, so this should be hopefully submitted shortly. And then finally, just to close um, with some next steps. Um, so there's a lot of, um, I guess when I was thinking about sort of what we're doing now and how to expand or next steps in our studies, um, um, as part of ECHO, uh, many of us are uh, working with pregnancy cohorts. And I think there's um, uh, several that are asking questions about discrimination. And I think that this is gonna become um, a, more of a norm um, when, when we have the opportunity to, to ask pregnant women about their experience, um, to get at, a, um, at um, a, how racism affects, our, uh, affects health. Um, and um, of course, this isn't always available um, when we're working with public data, as I often do. Um, but there has been some interesting work by Brittany Chambers using the index of the concentration of extremes to look at racial and ethnic segregation and income inequality. Um, so I also um, um, 
would like to do that in more studies and see that uh, more often. Um, and then incorporating multiple um, or addressing multiple stressors. So both environmental and social stressors and being able to model them um, uh, in combination. And uh, there's an interesting paper recently out um, by Dana Gowen um, in epidemiology on using G computation to address this. Um, and then finally, just wanted to um, just keep reminding myself to also ask policy relevant questions. So um, thinking about methods that can estimate health effects that are associated with targeting changes in communities. Um, so um, for example, with uh, counterfactual um, modeling where you can get counterfactual estimates. So if we were able to decrease the levels of some pollutant to it um, in a certain community, how much of a health disparity could we um, uh, reduce? Um, so, um, so I will finish there. I will, um, here are some things to follow for the Program for Reproductive Health and the Environment on social media. And I wanted to thank all of my uh, collaborators and our funders of, um, and open it up for questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, we are going to have a panel discussion with all of the speakers now um, before we get to participant questions. So if you guys could all unmute yourselves and um, come on camera if you feel comfortable, that would be great. Uh, great, thank you so much. Thank you um, for all of the great presentations. Um, so, uh, you know, in addition to the national conversation on systemic racism um, this year, there has been a lot more awareness of the Black um, maternal mortality crisis in America. According to the CDC, Black mothers in the U.S. to die at three to four times the rate of white mothers. Um, the issues are, of course, multifaceted and complex, but could you put today's um, talk um, in the context of this larger conversation? Um, how important of a role should environmental reproductive justice play in these conversations? So I can start. Um, I think that this is an area that's often um, not been integrated into discussions around Black uh, maternal mortality and Black maternal health more broadly. So um, when we look at what some of the, um, you know, kind of primary causes of, of Black maternal mortality are, many of them are cardiovascular um, disease um, risk factors or related to cardiovascular disease, particularly postpartum. And um, in the context of that, much of what we know about whether we're talking about air pollution or environmental chemicals um, or even metals exposures, we know that many of these conditions are linked to um, you know, cardiovascular disease and cardiometabolic health more broadly. And as we've presented here today, much of the, the work, not just um, you know, our specific work, but work even of others around the country um, show that there are differences in these um, exposures. So um, I do think that this conversation around what are some of the drivers of black uh, maternal health and adverse health outcomes really needs to better integrate uh, this disparity in environmental exposures. Thank you. Um, okay, um, there are a lot of, um, of things that we do know about environmental reproductive justice, but I think all three of you guys talked about how much um, research and how much unknowns there are. Um, since there are so many other fellow researchers and scientists on today's um, call or webinar today, could each of you say something um, to them about, you know, what do you think are the most important next steps um, they can take to advance research in this area? Um, how can they incorporate, you know, a, a reproductive justice lens into other research studies that they may have going on? Um, what are the most urgent gaps? Well, perhaps I can, I can add my, my two cents. Um, 
you know, I think this was touched on, Dr. Padula touched on this and Dr. James Todd touched on this. You know, this, this idea, yes, race is a social construct, but the social implications of, of being a woman of color have biologic impacts. And so there is a growing in terms of, of racism and structural factors that place communities and groups at disadvantage. Um, and there is a growing literature you know, showing that the psychosocial stresses, first of all, accumulate over time acutely and cumulatively, we predispose black moms and, and black women who are trying to become moms to um, more, um, more egregious effects of environmental pollutants. And so this idea of the, uh, the, the mixture of, of not just chemical stressors, like when we think of phthalates, for example, but the psychosocial stressors as a, a mixture occurring in certain groups, like black moms, that, that really is not taking place in white moms. And, and so um, paying attention to that is a direction that, that my group is, is interested in going. And, and that if you look through the literature really seems to be a promising path to try to one, um, more clearly identify the, the sources of the disparities and then using that knowledge to design and implement um, interventions to, to help to mitigate them. And I'd also um, like to add also, and I think um, also Dr. James Todd um, touched on this as well, but um, you know, because we use race so often as a proxy for so many other factors that we think are really truly um, impacting health, that we should really get to the why of like, of, of, of and rather than using race, maybe to look at additional factors in terms of why are those having um, such a big effect on, um, on, on different communities. And I think um, work, for example, that has been done on redlining um, has been really interesting because it's showing, you know, these policy chain, policy, um, decisions that were made and had a huge impact on, on, on where people live and what they're exposed to. And this is, um, you know, on, um, on everything from property value to exposures to them and their children and their children. So I think that, um, so kind of uncovering more of the historical pieces and, and finding more and getting more estimates of what we truly are looking for rather than just settling for the what we know ab about a woman's race um, as as kind of good enough um, to capture that. And, and relevant, I think, to what Amy just said, it's, um, it's really important to note that when we're doing our research and we're using, um, for example, analytic techniques that are looking at effect modification, it has a basic understanding that basis of doing and looking at stratified analyses and doing that is oftentimes for effect modification, that there's underlying differences in biology. And what we know about race is that race is a social construct. So we need to do a better job of really thinking about the why. Why do we see those differences? And as Michael just stated, it could be simply that there are higher exposure levels for some of these chemicals that then impacts biology, but it's not that there are indeed underlying biological differences between racial groups. And so better understanding that. So that's also why I provided some summary of what are some other analytic techniques? What are, what's the framework that we may wanna think about whether that's mediation analyses or doing multi-level analyses or mixed models. Um, and, and, and doing a better job of involving other disciplines and thinking about qualitative, the use of qualitative data analytic techniques. Great, that's super important. Um, so another uh, large part of our audience today are healthcare professionals, OBGYNs, midwives, nurses. Um, could you guys talk a little bit about what are the main takeaways that you would like for them to walk away with? Um, especially as they go back to taking care of patients. Okay, I'll start. Um, much of my work is embedded in um, doing clinical, clinically based um, research in this area. So we recruit at hospitals and we work very closely with um, 
um, our obstetrics teams at most, multiple hospitals across the Boston area. And I often get asked the question of, you know, what can we do? How do we do a better job of informing our patients? And I also happen to having taught at uh, Harvard Medical School, um, you know, um, there's no environmental health course in medical school. So it's worth noting that um, I think the, the starting point might be attending, you know, um, you know, seminars, um, webinars like this to kind of continue to become uh, more informed around these issues. But then the next step is, I think, being able to really assess environmental health literacy. How can, as, as gatekeepers, as information providers, um, can clinical um, healthcare providers provide accessible information to patient populations around this? And certainly, um, PHRE and CHG have done an incredible job providing information, um, as have many other groups. Um, and so becoming familiar with some of those materials, um, uh, the PESUs that are also around the country um, in various regions also have information um, that can actually be even patient facing um, that can communicate with the public around um, various exposures and health consequences. So I think that those are kind of starting places, um, but I do think we need to improve the environmental health literacy, both of our healthcare providers, as well as our patient populations. And it's been great to partner with the folks on our team um, to do some of that work. And just to add, um, so environmental health is becoming part of the curriculum at the medical school at UCSF. Um, so that's it's been a big push by Pre and others that are um, interested in incorporating that. Um, and I think, and hopefully it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and, um, and in terms of, I think in addition to um, what Dr. James Todd mentioned, I think I would also add that I think it's another part would be for clinicians to also pay attention to um, maybe to, to where people live and what other exposures they might um, come into contact to be, uh, because of that um, in terms of housing stock. I mean, that's an obvious one for things like lead, but you know, I think there are more nuanced ones if, um, in terms of um, you know, whether it be occupational exposures or um, exposures of uh, near where they live. So kind of incorporating that kind of more holistic view of, um, of health, I think is important to kind of potentially identify um, environmental risk factors. You know, I think it's dovetailing on what my colleagues mentioned and I agree completely. I think it's very challenging because if if you look at something like personal care products, sure, there are these, you know, presuming that they're accurate, there are phthalate free, paraben free products available, but their, their costs are multiples or, or magnitudes greater than the standard products. And, and so, you know, especially for disadvantaged populations who really don't have the financial means to avoid exposure, it's, it's another source of disparity to say, oh, try to use phthalate-free hair products or try to use phthalate-free lotions um, or benzophenone-free um, sunscreens. And so I, I don't know how to, you know, to, to address this, this larger structural issue that there are, yeah, there are approaches, but they're only available to this group. And that's kind of more of the same in some ways. And so um, that's just, just something that I've, I, I've kind of wrestled with um, in terms of how to mitigate these, these exposures um, among uh, pregnant moms and uh, disadvantaged groups. Yeah. Um, okay, um, I had two more questions um, before we answer some questions from the audience. Um, Tamara, you talked about in your paper the unequal distribution of protective factors. And um, uh, Amy, you might have mentioned those as well. We generally think about injustice in terms of disproportionate exposure to bad things, harmful things. Um, can you talk a little bit um, about examples of unequal distribution of protective factors? And um, do you think that these are just, import just as important to study for interventions? Yeah, no, it's a really great question. Thanks, Karen. Um, one of the pieces of feedback I often hear 
um, navigating a world where I'm both a black woman scientist is um, feedback from the populations that and communities that we work with where they are very frustrated that um, the, the ongoing discussion in the space of justice, whether it's environmental justice or reproductive justice, is a lack of identifying and discussing uh, resilience factors and protective factors. So in so many of these communities and populations, there are things that um, are, are good, that are ongoing, that are helping to protect populations. Um, and those are oftentimes not discussed. And what if we could do a better job of you know, using a lens and looking at those factors and amplifying those instead of amplifying the things that are not going so well. So um, a lot of the, the work that um, I've been doing is really been, again, because I focus in on environmental chemicals and personal care products, um, has really been in trying to get um, companies to provide safer products to women of color. And so uh, what's, what's increasingly happened is that a lot of the safer products have been either made or marketed exclusively to um, non-Hispanic white women. And in the, some of the initial work that we've done, um, when we actually approached uh, companies to try to work with them, we were told black women would not be interested in purchasing safer products, um, that there is no market there. And that's a really unfair, speaking to like protective factors, it's not, that's not right. And it's actually not true. Um, I was on a different panel um, a couple of weeks back to, to discuss some of this. So I, I think, you know, whether that's um, being able to make sure that the air in your home is, is you know, you know safer, um, is cleaner because you have the appropriate filtration systems or your home was built better and more, you know, um, in a way that will not allow for outdoor environmental risk factors to come in or the chemicals that we put on our bodies being produced in a safer way. Um, I think that there are many things that we could do to um, provide more protective factors that could reduce the disparities we see. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, and um, just because we're in the middle of a pandemic, I wanted to um, ask if any one of the speakers uh, could comment just about COVID-19 and how you think the pandemic um, which we know is disproportionately affecting vulnerable populations. Um, is that impacting your research? Um, and, you know, and how do you think it's impacting, you know, environmental reproductive justice? Um, I guess to, I, the first thing that comes to mind, um, of course, as an air pollution epidemiologist is that this is one of the a big risk factor for COVID um, uh, uh, mortality and morbidity, um, or even just infection is um, is air pollution in different areas. And of course, if that's disproportionately um, distributed in our population, which it is um, by race, ethnicity, then of course that's um, that is one um, factor. I think. The other, then there's also the whole issue of um, occupational um, exposure. So um, essential workers being exposed much more to the virus um, and those and that burden falling on um, more people of color. Um, and, and I think, um, and I, I know that the, um, yeah, and of course, with pregnancy being a vulnerable period, this is a, you know a particular concern. And even though it's it has the research hasn't been entirely clear yet on on the effects on pregnant women, I think that um, you know the it's um, you know this vulnerable period um, in terms of cardiovascular health and um, is is of of concern um, and. I could go on, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not a COVID expert, so I should stop. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to move now to some audience questions before we wrap up, um, since we're already over time a little bit. Um, Tamara's, uh, someone asked, do we have enough data to suggest racial differences in EDC concentrations across all ages beyond your Boston data? And how should we think about age, age and exposures? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I do think we have enough data uh, for some of the endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, and, and certainly I don't purport to think that that's the case for all, but uh, for some of those that um, Michael and I spoke about uh, today, there's pretty extensive data across the board, whether you're looking at national, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is what um, I presented today, or you were looking um, at data um, from other cohorts. Um, oftentimes as environmental epidemiologists, we place that data into um, our exposure tables and it's not necessarily our primary um, outcome that we're looking at. So I think that there's enough data um, across the life course to kind of show that children um, have higher exposures of, of these chemicals um, as do adults um, that happen to be um, non-Hispanic, Black or Hispanic. And so I, I think that that does warrant, um, you know, concern regarding the, it, those chemicals that are known to be associated with disparate outcomes. Okay. Michael, great. you may want to speak to that too, because I, I, I don't want to. No, I just, I, I agree. I think especially in children, those, those disparities have been, you know, reported quite consistently with, with children of color having higher burdens of many of these um, organic pollutants that are associated with endocrine disruption. And if, especially if you think of all the processes and growth and development going on that regulated by endocrine signaling, it's, it's really a terrifying prospect. Yeah, Dr. Bloom, um, we had a couple other questions um, specifically about phthalates. Um, can you just go back to the basics and say, um, what are the differences in the different phthalates? Um, what are some common sources? And we had, um, uh, an, an environmental health advocate also ask about uh, phthalates exposure in um, personal and feminine hygiene products. And have you looked at, at, at that as a potential exposure? Well, various phthalate diesters are, are added to different products, um, to plastics and to personal care products, but pretty uniformly, uh, universally to consumer products to impart certain properties like mass make plastics flexible, for example. And, and so these parent compounds, we are exposed to these through ingestion of food that's come into contact with say food packaging with a, a phthalate diester or a phthalate diester used as a solvent in a, a cream. And those are metabolized or broken down in your body pretty quickly to the chemicals that I reported these these M's, MMP, um, so on and so forth, MEHP. And so we measure these monoesters in the urine as markers for exposure to the parent uh, compound that was added to that product. Now, both the product, the parent compounds and these kind of breakdown products have been shown in laboratory experiments to impact hormone function, to increase oxidative stress, to alter epigenetic patterning, to have a host of a, a spectrum of bio effects that have also, they themselves been associated with adverse health effects. And so sources of exposure to some types of compounds are personal care products, such as our lotions, um, fragrances, um, um, creams, and uh, hair products as Dr. James Todd uh, um, described. And sources of other types called high molecular weight phthalates tend to be plastics. And so these will migrate into foods or beverages. Um, in terms of the personal care, excuse me, feminine hygiene products, I have not done any of that work. And my group was remiss in not including questions about use of these products in our study, because there is work that has been done on this and shown um, exposure associated with like use of vaginal douching, for example, and use of some other um, feminine hygiene products and that are used disproportionately by different uh, population subgroups. And so might likely are contributing to dispar disparate exposure. And so this is something we certainly plan to integrate into our future work, but that was an unfortunate oversight on, on our part. Okay, great. Um, Dr. James Todd, um, someone asked uh, about the, your results. Did you look at um, hairdressers and people um, who are working with these products? And I think relatedly, there was one question that in the panel discussion that um, I didn't get to, 
Um, could you also talk about um, other, you know, vulnerable populations apart from Black women? Um, and what are some of the unique issues facing these other groups of women? Yeah, no, um, great question. So to answer the first part of that question, um, hairdressers, I, we have not done that in our um, studies, although it certainly is a, a, a vulnerable population as are salon workers and, and so on. So certainly um, um, even in environmental service workers, uh, cleaners, um, or you know, people in the maid or service industries are exposed to more of these chemicals. And so that could have real impacts on their reproductive health outcomes. Um, so certainly hope that you know, you know, future work is done in that area. Regarding, you know, I th think we've spent a lot of time talking about Black maternal health, and it, indeed it is very important, but it's also important to note that there are disparities um, in other um, racial ethnic groups. So um, even in our own uh, work, we're looking at the role of acculturation as it relates to differences in chemical exposures. Um, we've shown that um, length of time in the US um, and age of migration, um, and so on um, are, are predictors of, for example, phthalate exposure. And um, we've all, we are also looking at um, associations. A lot of our research in the James Todd lab looks at the associations between phthalates and phenols as it relates to maternal dysglycemia. So looking at gestational diabetes, which is, um, as I mentioned, a, a, um, um, something that is two to three fold higher in the Asian and non his uh, or Asian and um, Hispanic populations, as well as the Native American population. So it's really important to note that other uh, racial ethnic groups need to be um, considered and taken into consideration when we're thinking about the intersection of environmental justice and reproductive justice. Yeah, great. I know that there's been information um, looking at nail salon workers and then uh, for cleaners, as you mentioned, yeah. Um, okay, what the last question I have is, um, do any of you uh, have suggestions on how to take this um, information back to communities and other stakeholders such as manufacturers in order to lower exposure disparities? In terms of bringing this information back to communities, I think this is a key piece um, so that communities can be advocates for um, for the environment. I know there's um, in Fresno, there's a really strong community, um, uh, you know, focused on, on air pollution because they are aware of the high levels. Um, and I think having a voice and, and being able to um, uh, you know, have an impact on policy. And I think it's, it's really a key piece. Um, I'll let the others speak to manufacturers. I think that's, there's a lot there too. You know, I, I might mention <clears throat> that, you know, manufacturers just manufacture what, what people buy. And, and so there has been, for example, bisphenol A was removed from you know, baby bottles in the US because people stopped buying them. And, and so the wallet is a very powerful means of persuasion, I suppose. But again, there's, there, there, it's not straightforward. There are complexities you know, given um, different uh, socioeconomic um, groups. And so yeah, I would, maybe dovetail on, on what Dr. Padula mentioned that, you know, education and helping to inform um, the public so that they can make informed decisions and in that way possibly influence, um, you know, what's available um, would, be a, would be a great, if we can expand on this, I realize it started, would make progress. And um, I think that both uh, Dr. Padula and Bloom raise really important points. We are working actively with community uh, groups and, um, and various community members and stakeholders to try to really develop, you know, um, not only the kind of knowledge base around this information, but also um, opportunities to teach and learn how to do advocacy work in this space. So um, that has been, um, a really interesting exercise to kind of enter into that space to work with community members who 
not only have interest in this, but you have to better understand um, kind of them as key stakeholders and what, um, how they can contribute to really addressing and asking the, the better questions. It's not that we're as scientists always gonna get the right questions into our questionnaires or whatever, but we can do a better job. So um, it's, been a, it's been a fun exercise to do that. Okay, great. Thank you so much um, for your time today, for your presentations, for the excellent panel discussion and for answering audience questions. Um, uh, we are so thrilled that you were here with us today. And Hannah, I will turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. James Todd, Dr. Padula, Dr. Bloom, for your speak for your presentations, and you, Karen, for moderating. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Che's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Che Alaska Partnership webinar will take place tomorrow, November 19th, and is titled Promoting a Culture of Health Through Racial Healing and Transformation. You can find details on our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up for, to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Tamara, James Todd, Michael Bloom, and Amy Padula for taking time to present today. And to you, Karen, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. We're wishing all much health and wellness. Have a great day.